welcome to the Bridging the Gap HR HR Conversations, the show that dives deep into crucial social issues affecting our world today. I'm your host, Ariba Shakil Ahmad, and in this episode, we are tackling a sensitive but incredibly important topic, the prevention of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is a pervasive issue impacting countless lives across the globe. Today, we are joined by Dr. Rosina Kermeliani, a renowned expert in this field, to shed light on the multifaceted aspects of this issue and discuss effective strategies for prevention. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosina, for joining us today. So, understanding the issue is the first step towards change. Um, let's begin by unpacking the basics. So, my first question to you is, can you help our listeners to understand what gender-based violence is and who it predominantly affects and what are some of the root causes um, or contributing factors to gender-based violence in our society? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. This is a platform which is uh, predominantly, uh, I'm considering it today for the youth and for the parents to start with. So your question around gender-based violence, if we look at um, different uh, multinational agencies like UNDP, UNICEF, um, Asian Development Bank, WHO, everyone has given their own definition but the core is that anything which is causing harm, uh, causing harm for physical, sexual, emotional, more so psychological and emotional, uh, people understand that well, mm -hmm. that it is a violence or a harm which is physical, a lot more than emotional and psychological. But it is also a coercion, it is also restrictions, it is also uh, harassment. It is also controlling behavior and threats, mm -hmm. which are not usually considered gender-based violence. So if we consider all of that, mostly in our societies, women are more subjected to this. And vulnerabilities are for children as well. So you keep hearing about child abuse and neglect. You keep hearing about women, uh, violence against women and girls, though it can be for men and women both, it can be for girls and boys both. Mm -hmm. But we are considering because women are overwhelmingly affected by this and girls are. True. And therefore the uh, pendulum is tilted towards women and girls more so, but it can be for anyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that insightful um, overview, Dr. Zina. So understanding these two causes is crucial for effective um, prevention strategies. Um, so now let's dive into the consequences of gender-based violence uh, and the importance of support systems. Um, so how does gender-based violence uh, impact the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of its victim? Uh, and what kind of support systems are essential for survivors? Additionally, um, how can communities better provide uh, these services? Hmm. There are two, three things within it. So let me know if I miss out on any of your question. So to start with, I will put it in a, a life cycle framework. So life cycle, if you see, it is starting from pre-birth. So pre-birth, uh, sex selection in terms of the gender. We want boy, we don't want girls. It starts from that. Then you come to the infancy, then nutrition, the deprivation to boys versus girls, mm -hmm. malnutrition. Uh, then you come to the childhood. Childhood abuse is common. Um, incest within the family is common for, for children. Then you come to adolescence period. Then uh, sex trafficking, girls trafficking, using girls in prostitution. Right. Then you come to the adulthood, intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. Then you come to the elderly. So children not providing comfort to their parents or uh, widows are also subjected and marginalized isolation. So isolation is also a form of violence because as you asked, impact. impact yeah. So overall, this entire life cycle has different impact during different time. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a nutritional deprivation, sometimes it's a, a neglect mm -hmm. from father, neglect from society or child abuse. In, at the workplace, child labor, 
So it has a physical is largely very much clearly seen, which is trauma, injuries. But psychological and emotional, which is not seen, causing anxiety and depression. And therefore, um, people who are in either intimate partner violence or family violence, domestic violence or workplace violence, are um, double the time under the anxiety and depression than those who are not. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know that one in three globally, women are under some form of violence. So its effect can be also on children. Mm -hmm. We were talking about women and girls, but it is intergenerational. So if mother is subjected to intimate partner violence or domestic violence, then uh, she is depressed, she is anxious. So her caretaking for the children is affected. Her isolation, her uh, society contribution, her productivity at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So it's a cost to society as well. Her absenteeism because of her injuries. And uh, generally, her upbringing of the children and family caregiver is also affected. So it has a, a physical, emotional, psychological, financial, social, cost attached to the gender-based violence right. and that could impact uh, in the child rearing and birthing as well. So for example, one of our study in uh, Hyderabad, we were looking at perinatal infections and birth outcome and psychosocial factors on women and birth outcomes and we found that infections were not huge, mm -hmm. infections were not significant right. in our society but nutrition and violence, depression was huge leading to preterm births leading to stillbirths. So it has a very correlational effect with the birth outcomes as well. So mm -hmm. that's huge impact. Right. So that's a powerful reminder uh, of the profound impact of this violence and the need for like, you know, comprehensive support mm -hmm. systems. Um, so prevention is key and education and technology can be a powerful tool uh, in this fight. So in what ways can education um, play a role in preventing gender-based violence and how can technology be used um, as a tool to prevent it? Mm. Generation Z and technology goes hand in hand. So I'm glad you asked that. And the educational spaces, of mm -hmm. course, are very important. Um, while we were talking about that it's an issue which is a public health issue, which is a developmental issue, and it has a life course. And therefore, the strategies and support system also needs to be uh, multidimensional. Mm -hmm. So if we take a, a model from individual to family to institution to society, uh, many of the audience may be familiar with the ecological model which takes you from the individual to the society. So strategies needs to be at all levels. So for example, at the individual level, it could be drug abuse, it could be substance abuse, alcohol. It could be neglect from father, absent father. Um, it could be child not wanted. Mm. So the strategies could be how do we make the family environment and the parenting from the family, starting with that, that strategy is very important. Then we, from the individual person to the family, it could be poverty in the household. Mm -hmm. Like recently, yesterday only, I was reading Dawn article yeah, which that you shared in, with me as well. I, yeah. I did, yeah. So that was very eye-opening, mm -hmm. but sad at the same time, because domestic violence was there, gender-based violence was there. But COVID time brought mental health issues, brought violence issues more prominent. Mm -hmm. So Asian Development Bank study was reported in Dawn yesterday, yeah. was sharing that 40% increase mm -hmm. in violence during the pandemic time. So next pandemic for for Pakistan is gender-based violence and therefore the strategies need to be changing the narrative of the country. Mm -hmm. We have to bring this in the healthcare system of Pakistan. Unfortunately, the government has not paid much attention even to the report which has came out yesterday. The stakeholders were saying that very minimum attention by the government has been played on that. Whereas India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, if you see these countries, these countries have brought the strategies which have been piloted and now upscale because mm -hmm. they have taken it as a national agenda and place it as a national public health issue and therefore entire health system 
from the primary to the secondary to tertiary, tertiary is addressing yeah. that. Right. And therefore, it has to be a gender norm shifting, the, mm -hmm. the patriarchal society. How do we change that? So I'm glad you asked the educational spaces because educational spaces can change the gender norms. True. Educational spaces can target uh, girls and boys mm -hmm. early on when their minds are uh, changeable, mm -hmm. their minds are trainable or they are thinkers to change the situation and the scenario. So I think the strategy for the healthcare is integrating it within the primary, secondary, tertiary. At the country level, we need laws, we need policies, we need the narrative actually towards the approach to gender-based violence right? and True. not marginalizing it only that, okay, this is women issue, this is personal issue, this is household issue. Mm -hmm. Just because you are asking, that's one of the strategy, because you are saying no more silence, just break the silence and talk about it. Mm -hmm. If one in three are subjected to it, it's no more a household issue and domestic issue. True. It is a public health issue. Right. So indeed, um, education and technology could be a game changer. Um, in this battle. So let's turn our focus to legal and policy aspects um, crucial for addressing this issue. So how effective are the current legal frameworks um, in addressing and preventing gender-based violence and what policy changes are needed to more effectively com combat it or, you know, what, what are your views on that? Mm. I'm glad you asked because uh, there has been a struggle for last 20 years mm -hmm. in Pakistan by different non-governmental organizations, women movements towards bringing the laws and policies. We, I would not say that it's not there. I would say we have um, child abuse and neglect law, we have workplace harassment policy, we have women trafficking policy, uh, we have uh, um, violence um, uh, act and policies and law enforcement. Uh, but this is a provincial issue in Pakistan so far mm -hmm. and not national. So some provinces have gone ahead and have the, uh, uh, this act to be actually implemented and some provinces have not. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring the narrative at one place and make it a national uh, framework for laws and policies? And you know that only having policies and laws doesn't change the scenario. Exactly. It has to be enforcement mm -hmm. and enforcement is so important. So for example, currently, if, some, uh, if a woman goes to police station, first of all, she's victim, she's further subjected to be victimized that she has reached to the police station. Then if the FIR is launched, because it is against, it is a crime, uh, then the punishment is very minimum. Right. The punishment is not serious enough, but at least it's there. Mm -hmm. It's there, so it raises, at least at the workplace scenario or at the household scenario, if she says, I'll go to the police, something, some effects have come through. Right. But then, uh, uh, you know, the bribe culture, the corruption, the charges are dropped easily, the punishment is not serious enough, um, the influential gets away easily, and then at the end, Media plays their role, but then what happens to that person who went to the police station? So we need the entire, earlier you were asking, the support system. Support system exactly. So entire support system can come from workplace, mm -hmm. it can come from families, it can come from institutions, institutions right. like educational institutions, workplace institutions. Mm -hmm. And therefore it is important that we don't only uh, look at the provincial policies and act, but these are important, so I'm not undermining. Uh, until those are not there, we won't be able to enforce anything. But how do we make it an uh, entire uh, uh, national level agenda and then launch it and enforce it at the national level? Right, thank you so much, Dr. Rosina, for answering that question. So culture and community play a pivotal role um, in preventing um, gender-based violence. So how do culture norms and societal mm -hmm. uh, attitudes contribute to gender-based violence? And how can we challenge these norms? And what can individuals like us, like me, uh, and communities do to actively participate in this um, prevention? So what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. So that's the most important question I consider for, for uh, 
many cultures but especially as we are talking in context of Pakistan that um, it is so deep rooted and you reminding me of um, um, of um, 11 year old girl uh, telling me in Hyderabad so I was working in Hyderabad schools public schools and 11 year old saying legitimizing mm -hmm. that it is okay for my father to beat my mom and her narrative was coming from deep rooted cultural norms which she has seen so she said if she doesn't listen to my father my father said do not talk to the neighbor why did she talk my father said this time the food should be on the table why was she taking more time at the grocery store why did she call her mother and why did she go to the mother's place so all those behavior for a 11 year old was legitimizing beating father to mother mm -hmm. this is how deep rooted it is correct in terms of the couple punishment in schools it's so deep rooted one of the boy sixth grader told me you don't have a stick so you are not a good teacher so it is norm that at the name of discipline we have violence at the name of discipline we have physical punishments how do we change this entire notion of positive disciplining so husband is saying that i'm beating for disciplining parents are saying we are beating children for disciplining teachers are saying we are beating for disciplining so everybody is using physical punishment and abuse for disciplining mm -hmm. so overall i think the cultural and the norm change will definitely start from family and schools schools are big the educational sector can perform a huge That's role yeah. and now youth like you are using this platform the social media we need more directors and producers in tv who are women and bringing the women narrative bringing the household narrative so a mother treating boy and girl equally mm -hmm. son and daughter equally mm -hmm. a mother being empowered resilient self-confident self-esteem mm -hmm. that can all transfer to the children but what what do we give to our our sons my work initial 10 years was all with women and girls when i started working with boys schools and girls schools in hyderabad that changed my own paradigm mm -hmm. and how and that i think one element uh, which i learned from boys school gave me the idea that how do we shift this paradigm mm -hmm. and what is it I, when i was talking to boys i found that the boys for the livelihood are early on in the labor force so they are in the labor market because the entire economic responsibility we have put on the men and boys so in the labor market they are punished they are beaten they are abused when they go to the labor market they are missing their school they are missing their classes no. when they come to school mm -hmm. teachers are complaining that you missed school days you are behind when they go home parents say teacher was complaining and their energies are more so we don't know how to channelize boys energies more and then hunger and poverty food insecurity mm -hmm. hungry stomach and all of this around a boy makes a boy in the adult life perpetrator what they are witnessing they are witnessing violence in society they exactly. are witnessing violence at home mother father marital relationship issues if a boy is seeing all of this and the girl at that age interestingly is very much pampered she's father's doll she is liked by the teachers she studies well she's liked by the parents mm -hmm. so everything is good when she is little but the scenario reverse mm -hmm. when the boy become adult husband or a brother or a father becomes the perpetrator and she the girl who was pampered so much is now subjected to violence and is victim so this scenario i feel really that we need to change from the educational sectors from the home that how do we give safe environment and lesson 
the marital relationship issues and violence around the society in school through the corporal punishment for boys and girls both. Both. I felt very bad for boys and I said, what are we giving to our boys? We need to work differently in our educational sectors with boys and half of the children are not even in education sector. Half mm -hmm. of the children are not even in school. So who is there? Community around. And therefore, the strategies from the grassroots, community, peer group support, friendship supports are very important in the neighborhood. Indeed. The play mm -hmm. groups are essential. And therefore, my work with Right to Play, I would say it's so crucial. Right to Play is an NGO which believes that every child, when play, they are very happy. They win the world. And through that, we can change the norms. Mm -hmm. Through, through the play, we can change the norms because there is a lot about reflection. There is a, a lot about connecting to the world around them. Mm -hmm. And then they are happy as well while exactly. doing that. Mm -hmm. So using the sports and play is a very powerful medium for, for changing and the positive disciplining. Right. So challenging these deep rooted norms is like essential for lasting change. Um, exploring this issue from a global perspective um, can offer valuable insights. Um, so mm. my next question to you is that how does gender based violence differ across the world? Um, what can we learn from international approaches to its prevention? And what are some proven strategies mm. um, or impactful case studies mm. or programs um, that have been effective in preventing it? I'm glad that we are not ending only on the issues, <laughs> but also talking about what is there, what has worked, what has worked and where we are heading. Uh, global perspective, I would say that um, East and West, South or North, it's a global issue to start with. Educated or literate, illiterate, educated, uneducated, different socio-economic strata. It is everywhere, but the types are different. Uh, the presentation is different. Mm -hmm. Issues are different. Right. The issues in a low socio-economic um, culture scenario, the livelihood becomes the the most like the ADP study mentioned that during the COVID time, because of the inflation and the livelihood issues, mm -hmm. the violence increased 40%, for example. Um, so it is certainly a, a big issue. Um, then if we look at um, some of the countries, what they've done, see that has changed the scenario. What have they done? So awareness, um, educational sector, uh, bringing parents, uh, bringing the education sectors. Above all, the country, state taking the responsibility. So as I mentioned earlier, that if it is in every country, then what we should learn from what India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have done. Pakistan has put minimum attention, minimum attention and minimum attention to the responses. But these countries who are very similar to our culture mm -hmm. have piloted that interventions and what has worked, they are now scaling up. Some of the countries in East Africa have good programs. So you, for example, you asked what are the examples which has worked? So I think one, um, a clear intervention, one or two clear interventions I will talk about. Uh, one is women economic empowerment mm -hmm. is very important. And therefore, um, we should think collectively at the country level, at the institutional level, at the educational level, how to bring entrepreneurship, how to give trainings mm -hmm. uh, that the women are able to get the jobs, get into the business market, attend and retain the jobs. These are skills. So there are some programs which have done microfinance. We need to move now from microfinance to using the banking sector more. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are on the agriculture land. And land production, women are working at the land, but uh, it's uh, no money. Women are working as caregiver at the home, mm -hmm. no money. So when there is no money in the caregiving role, which largely women are doing, no money at the agriculture, there is no share in the land. These are also part of the policy norms. Exactly. It's not only the direct violence, but all the other resources 
which are available to women, very less resources are available to her. And therefore, um, uh, one of my study here in Karachi, Bilal Colony, when we were doing the life skills building, we were doing the uh, adult literacy program with Sin Education Foundation. Women's narrative was that, show us where the money is. Mm. Give us uh, skills that we can get the jobs. Give us uh, social support programs. So for example, social protection programs such as Benazir Income Support Program which is unconditional cash transfer, mm. SRS program. So unconditional cash transfer is not adding additional caregiving burden, exactly. not adding other work role. So women is now in the workforce. If you ask working women, they would say, what did we do with us? Triple burden. We are taking care of the caregiving role. We are doing household stuff. We are doing job work. We are raising the children. So how much additional things we can put on mm. uh, women and therefore the shared responsibilities. So another uh, intervention as you asked, so one is certainly women economic empowerment and ways and means and training, social protection programs of the country. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, engaging men and boys from mm. the very early on is extremely important. Most of the NGOs have worked um, with women only or with girls and therefore it's important that we as I gave the example of Hyderabad schools and Thatta schools generally the same narrative we need to work early on from uh, early childhood development mm -hmm. giving the parenting skills of positive disciplining working with boys giving them positive environment giving them uh, confidence and skills girls and boys both and uh, um, working with men. So when we were, for example, working with women in, in Bilal Colony, they were saying that, okay, you are explaining all of this to us. What about the men at home? Who will change their thinking? Who will change their skills? Right. What is the support system men has? What is the support system women has? And also there's one important phenomenon in Pakistan. I don't know how, in how many other countries uh, is the mother-in-law phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So mother-in-law role is very important. Many a times mother-in-law role is very important family support system. But also mother-in-law has the empowerment which she never had before. So if she reverses her role from the harmony family to using the control on the daughter-in-law and therefore they said, please work and show us money, money and men. Mm -hmm. and mother-in-law. So these are the three M's <laughs> we need to work on. Right. Show us the money, work on men also and bring mother-in-law as a family harmony dynamic. While she's very supportive, she needs to be also learning that what the current youth and the children are going through and giving the skills to her as well. So I would say that family strategies are important. Family examples are important. One of the um, uh, successful um, intervention which was done in Pakistan, which now WHO has put in their uh, model well, as a respect yeah. model, mm -hmm. is uh, from right to play. That uh, six graders were given a structured curriculum of play therapy, then reflect, connect and apply through the teacher and the coach model. And that is for school going children and out of school children as well. When there is a coach, there is a, a peer leader and taking them through reflect, connect and apply. In two years time, we found gender norms changing. We found depression getting down. We found 50% violence getting down, mm -hmm. corporal punishment reducing. And children were witnessing less violence. So very powerful strategy. Some of the other countries, for example, East Africa, football mass is a very powerful project. What they do is in football game, as you all know, football game, you give a penalty card. Mm -hmm. What they do is they don't give penalty card for wrongdoings. They give cards for good do deeds. Uh -huh. So if there is a good play in a team, they give a card. Oh, nice. So it's a changing the narrative mm -hmm. of from the penalty to incentivizing the yeah. and the positive thinking. So that's a very powerful one. Uh, Brazil now recently looked at social protection program and they found that 50% uh, reduction in uh, societal ideation 
and uh, uh, depression, uh, violence reduction because of the social protection program which was providing unconditional cash transfer. And mm -hmm. therefore, the programs such as I mentioned with Penesas, we need to look at these programs, we need to provide to the ultra poor, to the poor, uh, we need to create the means for, for women to be able to get money and bring them into the entrepreneurship. I think these are the skills around the world has worked. These are the skills that have worked in the, in the region. And these are the skills which have worked in Pakistan. But the important is these are not scale up. Hmm. We need scale up programs. Uh, to bring that. Right, right. Thank you so much, Dr. Zina, for answering that question. And, and this was very elaborate. Too. Yeah, and also like men and boys have a crucial role in shaping uh, the future of gender equality. Um, so my next question is last question uh, is that what gives you hope about the future of preventing gender based violence? So those who know me, they know that I see has gla have glass full first before <laughs> I see the glass empty as well. Um, so to me, um, Truly saying, I have less hope. I'm not saying no hope, but I have less hope uh, with um, overall national government policies and law enforcement agencies. But I have more hope uh, with youth. I have a lot of hope in youth. 40% of our population in Pakistan is youth. 48%, so almost half of the population. We don't have a lot of elderly people, but we have youth. So my hope is with youth that if we work through the social media platforms, through uh, digital platforms, through TV, uh, through schools, uh, through play therapy, out of school children, uh, if we bring in youth and if we give them positive disciplining, if we give them good environment today, they will raise their children differently. Mm -hmm. And when they will change the household scenario differently, they will bring the change. Because these are not like six weeks training course and you are done. Mm -hmm. These are ingrained in culture. And therefore, if today's youth become good parents, today's youth learn the parenting skills. Exactly. They will train and they will treat their children differently and that can change a lot in an overall society. So I have a lot of hope in, in youth and people like you <laughs> that you will take this in a, in a, in a different level, uh, household level and also then uh, changing uh, the platforms, mm -hmm. which are education platform or digital platform. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zina. It's heartening to discuss the positive roles and uh, the hopeful aspects of this ongoing struggle. So now hold on to your seats. Uh, we are diving into a rapid fire question. This is our last part of uh, the podcast series. So are you ready, Dr. Rosina? <laughs> you will get only 10 seconds, um, 10 seconds. to, okay. to answer, but you will have the option to choose both or you can indicate which one would be your priority. Okay. So uh, while selecting these answers. 10 so, seconds for a teacher is, <laughs> is tough. I'll try. All right. So let's let's start this. Um, youth education or adult awareness? So I'll give a preamble first. <laughs> See, a lot of things will be good for both mm -hmm. while you are asking youth and adult. But in 10 seconds, if I have to pick one versus the other, I would certainly say youth. Mm -hmm. All right. Social media advocacy or traditional media campaigns? Social media, for sure. Gender sensitivity training or harassment policies? Both. Public forums or confidential helplines? Certainly both. We need to work for survivors as well. Culture norm challenge or policy enforcement? Culture norm challenge, policy <laughs> enforcement, both. But uh, policy enforcement is not working. All right. Um, behavioral research or statical analysis? Oh, certainly behavioral because this is a developmental issue. Survivor empowerment or public education? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave this, those who are victim for survivors, so both. Okay. Both. Grass public education is important. All right, thank you. Grassroots initiatives or government programs? Uh, both because we can't do much without the public and government as well. But if I have to choose one out of the two, a grassroots initiative, community initiative. Thank you so much, Dr. Zina. It was wonderful having oh, that you. That wasn't difficult. <laughs> <laughs>
I thought I wouldn't be able to do it in 10 <laughs> seconds. You were good. To our listeners, thank you so much for joining us in this important conversations. We hope this episode has been enlightening and inspires action towards preventing gender-based violence. Remember, change starts with awareness and each one of us can make a difference. Until next time, I am Ariba Shakil Ahmed and this is the Bridging the Gap ASAR HR Conversations. Stay safe.